Okay, hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Beatrice and today is going to be my first video uh, in my Faith and Academia series and I'm joined by my very good friend from Oxford, Jasmine Jones. Um, so I'll introduce you to Jasmine briefly and then I'll let her speak and give us her insights on English studies and academia and bringing your faith into your scholarly work. So Jasmine is a second year PhD student in English at St Edmund Hall, University of Oxford, where she's a Clarendon Scholar and a Bruce Mitchell Scholar of Old and Middle English. Her thesis is supervised by Professors Sarah Foote and Francis Lenigan, and it analyzes the earliest writings which survive in the English language, which are Anglo-Saxon religious poems from around 1700 sorry, to 850 AD. Jasmine also studied her MPhil in Medieval English at Lady Margaret Hall, Oxford, and before that, her BA in English at University College London. Originally from Reading, Jasmine is aspiring for an academic career in which she can continue to research what she loves and share this through teaching others. So that's a wonderful introduction to um, what we're going to dis be discussing today. I know Jasmine very well because we did the... Um, um, well, the masters together at Oxford, even though we were in different strands, but just for um, people watching um, the channel today, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to start your PhD, the kind of journey that brought you to this stage of your academic life? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I always loved English literature when I was at school. I think because of a combination of the emphasis on close reading so really zooming in microscopically to every text and understanding how meaning is created through language. And then also because of the emphasis on history and situating texts within their historical context and questioning the influence of theology and social issues on authors mm -hmm. and their texts. Mm -hmm. And I also really loved languages at school. <laughs> Um, so I did Latin and French and Spanish. And when I encountered medieval literature in mm -hmm. my first year of my undergraduate in English at UCL, mm -hmm. I was really struck because there was this intersection of everything I loved, basically. So literature, history, theology and languages, because you have Old English and Middle English and Old English dates from roughly 650 mm -hmm. to just after the Norman conquest and it's a very Germanic language and it's an inflected language so it's like Latin it has a mm -hmm. case system um, and then Middle English dates from just after the Norman conquest um, up until around 1500 more or less and that's much more French influenced and mm -hmm. more less in, it, in its vocabulary so it just seemed like the perfect synthesis of mm -hmm. all of my passions. And I was really drawn to that. Um, also, I was really surprised because I never expected my faith to be so central to my mm -hmm. academic interests. And I remember the first class of Old English that we had, and it's the standard text that everyone gets introduced to, which is The Wanderer. Mm -hmm. And The Wanderer is this poem that describes um, a solitary wanderer. And this is a man who is in a boat and he's sailing across a very stormy, very turbulent ocean. Mm -hmm. And he's just been separated from his band of warriors. And he's lamenting the loss of this warrior culture that he was so attached to. And so it's this type of poem is called an elegy, which means it's kind of lamenting and it's very preoccupied with exile and loss. And the whole poem was about how earthly life is very transient. And in a warrior culture, things like treasure and military success and reputation, these are all very fleeting um, possessions. Mm -hmm. And over the course of the poem, this solitary solitary wanderer is kind of meditating on mm -hmm. how transient life is, just like the water is so choppy and it, unstable. It's the same with earthly life. 
And the poem ends with him seeking consolation in the father in the heavens. Mm -hmm. And it talks about how security is found in eternal life. And it's very much framed within a Christian context. Um, and I just remember encountering this poem in my first Old English class, mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe how my own faith that I practice mm -hmm. every day and the God that I pray to every day mm -hmm. and also find security in this monk who wrote this poem in mm -hmm. like 700 AD mm -hmm. was having the same experience of that mm -hmm. um, through this um, solitary wanderer who the poem describes. So it was just an amazing connection like across the centuries mm -hmm. and yeah I just felt so in awe of that mm -hmm. and being able to experience God so explicitly through mm -hmm. the literature that I was studying. Um, so yeah it was really after that experience at undergraduate I then specialized mm -hmm. in Old and Middle English mm -hmm. in my second and third years and then mm -hmm. came to Oxford and did the masters mm -hmm. specifically in medieval English Mm -hmm. And now my doctorate focuses on the very early period. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the literature I study is from around 700 and 800 AD. Mm -hmm. It's the religious poetry that mm -hmm. monks were producing mm -hmm. um, and the roots of English literature. So it's really exciting. And I'm mm -hmm. just really grateful for being able to study it because it's quite mm -hmm. rare nowadays in university English faculties. Yeah. Interesting. So you're saying it's quite rare to study that particular um, like area of Old English. Why do you think that is? Um, why do you think that's not something that's so common right now? Yeah. So actually, there's not many faculties that have any mm -hmm. medieval um, period. Most most English faculties nowadays mm -hmm. begin from Shakespeare, which is early modern, technically. That, which is such a shame. <laughs> but yeah. but you're probably like, right. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think. I think there's various reasons. I think because mm -hmm. the languages are hard and you really have to learn the language to be able mm -hmm. to appreciate the text in the original because the translations don't really do it justice. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's hard work. And also I think that the theological nature of much of the medieval mm -hmm. literature, because it's all be before the Reformation, mm -hmm. it's in its very nature, it's intensely devotional and theological and... I think that that's not something that's particularly of interest so much nowadays. Um, so maybe that also has led to a decline in right. he's teaching it. Um, yeah. Do you think it's just harder to kind of access that culture because it, it feels very removed from us now because of the language, but also because of the kind of focus of these texts? Yeah, I think okay. so. Mm -hmm. And um, even particular approaches like close reading, mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of seen as a bit old fashioned now. It is, isn't it? Because it's yeah. a kind of new critics and that was from what, the, the 50s or the 60s. So yeah, it's a long exactly. time ago now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I see. That's really interesting. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. How do you incorporate the close reading aspect with with the more kind of historical, um, mm. I guess, lens? Because um, a lot of people tend to do one or. And yeah. it's I, I, I like to do both and my scholarship as well so I want to hear more about that how does that kind of come together for you that's a really good question um I think that it's important very much to have both because mm -hmm. you don't want to zoom in so much that you lose the kind of overarching significance and I agree yeah um, it just becomes a kind of spot the literary device kind of exercise which right. is very easy to do um mm -hmm. I think, yeah, I just think it's so important to be able to understand the meaning of those words in mm -hmm. the broader picture and yeah. what they relate to, mm -hmm. what they're referring to. Mm -hmm. um, the things are very much in dialogue. So I suppose um, when I'm when I'm writing a part of my thesis, for example, I kind of, I have the dual question in my mind of, right. uh, what does this mean on the page? But then mm -hmm. what does it mean um, within the whole text and even within the whole corpus of old English literature, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, and what else is it in conversation with in terms of yeah. theological doctrine or mm -hmm. historical events? 
um yeah 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 that's really cool you're able to kind of zoom in and then zoom back out whenever you, yeah. you need to um which I love and uh you started telling me a little bit about your your current research do you can you tell us a bit more about that so I know did you used to focus more on middle English and now you do more old English is that right what yeah, are you that- writing your PhD about tell, tell us more so yeah I was definitely more of a late medievalist originally mm-hmm. Um, the first medieval text I ever read was Julian of Norwich's um, Revelations of Divine Love. Which I'm going with... to be reading soon and I'm very excited about really? it. Really? Yeah. Oh, for okay. class, I'm very excited. Yeah. Oh, okay. Awesome. So that was yeah, a good entry point. Such a good mm-hmm. text. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. English mystic, um, yeah, with this really exquisite account of her mm-hmm. um encounters with Christ and I was just really captivated by that Mm -hmm. and I'd never read anything like it um so I was really um really really interested in the late medieval trend of devotion Mm -hmm. but then I think um as time went on I realized that I also really loved going to the roots and to the source of um English really and to be able to read the very earliest writings that we have in the language which has really excited me. And Mm -hmm. so now my thesis looks at, um, yeah, the earliest poems that we have. And so they're adaptations of the Old Testament and they're also lives of saints and meditations on the incarnation. Mm -hmm. And I basically study these texts and really try and understand what they show about early Christian beliefs in Anglo-Saxon England Mm -hmm. and particularly in relation to um, grace and free will and man's relationship with God and how the first Christians in England perceived God as acting Mm -hmm. in salvation history Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah it's it's really rich and yeah it's just so eye-opening because most people think that it's a very simplistic kind of theology Mm -hmm. because before the high middle ages and uh when everything is so much more developed um but Mm -hmm. actually um what i'm finding is that the theology is very sophisticated and interesting yeah there's a lot of different influences coming from different places and Mm -hmm. yeah so it's really rewarding right is it do you think it's perceived as being less sophisticated because it's not like kind of like like systematic or like scholastic theology yeah, of exactly. that okay yeah. okay which is similar to 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 Julian of Norwich right people used to think of her mm-hmm. as not really being a theologian because she's more she writes in a more kind of mystical way um but now people have started to think of her more as a theologian in, in her own right would you say that the kind of same thing is happening with these poems that you're, you're looking at although obviously they're from a different era I think so yeah interesting that's fantastic and um and obviously in in uh, in your research that you're doing you're you know you're you're writing about people who um were very devotional it sounds like and, and who belong to a culture that that um took kind of faith seriously how do you kind of how do you find writing about um about theological concerns in your own research do you ever find that it's kind of hard to reconcile with with being in in academia and academia being mostly secular or have you been kind of encouraged in your pursuits so of just how's that been like for you <laughs> yeah they're really good questions yeah. um I think that I've been really blessed because a lot of, well, all of the literature that I study is quite explicitly religious and devotional. Right. So um, kind of have yeah. to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but even still, I find that I have to be quite um, nuanced in my approach. Sure. And mm-hmm. like my priority is to be very academically accurate and yeah, to reveal sure. genuine truths mm-hmm. and I, for example, at the start of my PhD, I was very interested in allegory and mm-hmm. I kind of was looking in all of these texts for different allegories of the church. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of was forcing there to be allegories in text. Because you wanted where... to find that because exactly. it was something important to yeah. you. Mm-hmm. And it's not um, like theologically wrong in the sense mm-hmm. that allegory is a big part of scriptural mm-hmm. exegesis and things but I could tell I was really imposing it even a theological mm-hmm. framework you can force too much sure. and so, yeah yeah now I'm mm-hmm. kind of like I need to let the texts reveal themselves to me mm-hmm. and 
Um, so even with what I think is a sensitive theological approach, you don't mm -hmm. want to push it too much. And yeah. yeah, the accuracy of your research is really what's important. And mm -hmm. you don't want to come across kind of too proselytizing or yeah uh, kind of too like pietistical or something exactly. like that because that that's just going to make people take you less seriously and then what's the point of the valuable work you're doing exactly. yeah, that, yeah that makes a lot of sense I think I think that's right and I think trying to not impose that theological framework like you were like you were saying but trying to let this I like your idea of kind of the texts reading themselves to you and then and then seeing okay when can I actually talk about um about this having theological concern so that I, I think that's right and I think that's that's going to make other scholars who might perhaps be a little bit skeptical about your methods actually respect you and I think that's yeah. kind of that's kind of the way to go um yeah that that makes a lot of sense and uh and I think I'm trying to do the same with with my research and trying to be very accurate and trying not to kind of impose my perspective now on texts that are from the past um and that's obviously a very important is aspect of it um but I also often wonder like when it comes to just me as as a as not necessarily in my research but just as a scholar overall how like how can I make sure that I don't separate my faith from my scholarship even though I don't want to be like obviously I don't want to be overly pietistical in my research but I still want to make sure that my faith is part of my identity as a scholar and that's something that I've found at times hard which I'm sure everyone does at times um what how can, how have you found it is there something you kind of do or other things you're trying to remind yourself of to make sure that that aspect of your life just doesn't kind of disappear into the background when you're doing your kind of academic very scholarly mm. pursuits you know when you're yeah. pursuing those things mm. that's another very good question um <laughs> honestly I pray a lot um mm -hmm. during the day because <laughs> I really just need strength to be able to be disciplined with my study yeah. mm -hmm. and I think I really need a lot of grace for kind of intellectual mm -hmm. discovery and yeah. especially with the doctorate um, mm -hmm. you need so much kind of stamina and perseverance and yeah. sometimes you probably can relate as well like yeah. when you have to do something so arduous like mm -hmm. footnotes or mm -hmm. bibliography or proofreading mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. something you really don't want to do yeah. um, I have to kind of put it in a kind of supernatural framework and really like yeah. offer it up in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, there's something very um, character building about it and spiritually rewarding as well. And I just really feel, I feel as well that um, really focusing so much on texts. Um, I just think how like, in the incarnation it's the word mm -hmm. becomes flesh and mm -hmm. the logos and mm -hmm. how as literary scholars we have this yeah. access to the logos in a way that's kind of unique and we, yeah. we can really understand what it means to to kind of penetrate to the depths of truth and yeah, yeah there's something so um transcendent about that and that's so beautiful <laughs> yeah, I think always remembering that really mm -hmm. me. um mm -hmm. and also the kind of contemplative spirit that you get yeah. reading and thinking and um it kind of pervades your whole mm -hmm. existence and mm -hmm. I think prayer is really the pulse that kind mm -hmm. of keeps beating underneath everything yeah that's really beautiful um when you were speaking just now I, I kept thinking of a lot of the medieval like the theologians that I've been reading this this semester as part of my PhD and um and lots of them talk about what it means to be a kind of Christian scholar um mm -hmm. and they and and they talk about humility which I think is so beautiful like you find that in um um in the rule of Saint Benedict and you find that in um in Hugh of Saint Victor and all these different medieval theologians and they're all you know they're all scholars they're all people who are extremely well educated but the first step towards knowledge for them is humility and that I think is something that um that I try to remember because I, you know in today's academic world um there is so much pressure on publishing new stuff and being original and being the kind of the smartest person in the room and showing that to others showing that you're you're the kind of the wisest person you're the person who's finally kind of cracked the code and you've figured out how to interpret a text um and that can put so much pressure on people to publish stuff just for the sake of kind of look at me mm -hmm. i'm smart and that's completely the wrong attitude to take um and um 
and yeah, instead we should kind of focus on truth, which I think in itself is possibly like kind of a controversial thing to say that there is like a truth to discover. Um, but but you have to you have to at least agree on that. Otherwise, like what's the point of scholarship, you know? Um, but yeah, I think that's 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 really beautiful. Um, yeah, prayer is so important. I try to do the same um, in, you know, when I have a big assignment and it feels like it's never going to come together. I try to think, okay, why am I actually doing this? I'm doing this to try to figure out what the truth is. Um, yeah. And that comes from from me having, from my faith, essentially. So mm -hmm. that's really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, very good. Um, I was trying to think of what else I wanted to ask you. Oh, yes. Um, I'm not a medievalist. I'm trying to think what I have read from the Middle Ages. Very little Old English and not and all in translation. I've read a bit of Chaucer, which is what everyone reads. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, if you've read any medieval literature, it's probably Chaucer, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and that that I that's all I know. Um, so what what should I be reading? You know, what is what is mm. one medieval text or some medieval texts that you just wish more people knew about? Oh, that's tricky. <laughs> so much. That's so, so good. Um, okay. If if I might say one Old mm -hmm. English, Middle English. So mm -hmm. Middle English, I would have to say it's um, the poem that's called Pearl. Um, yes, which I've heard about, but I don't know anything about, unfortunately. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. I think it's, it's just so beautiful. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's deeply theological and... Mm -hmm. um, the, the broad summary is um, a man is lamenting the bereavement of his daughter and mm -hmm. he goes to sleep and um, in in his dream he's um, he has a vision of his daughter mm -hmm. and um, it's all about how she's in the heavenly Jerusalem and mm -hmm. um, he learns about the truth of eternal life from her. Mm -hmm. And it's just such a poignant poem, the way that it's written. And um, yeah, this was in the 14th century. So around the time of the Black Death. So we know that um, bereavement was a very common experience mm -hmm. um, in society. And uh, the meaning of the pearl evolves mm -hmm. over the course of the poem. So at the beginning it refers to the daughter that he's lost because she's very young and to her purity and innocence and then it becomes the pearl and then the pearl of the eucharist so it just sees really really um yeah just really stunning images so i would really recommend that and then old english um there's a, a set of 12 lyrics called the mm -hmm. advent lyrics and okay. these are liturgical poetry mm. poems mm -hmm. um, and they're based on the O antiphons for Advent. Oh beautiful, yeah. wow, okay. So mm -hmm. They take an antiphon like mm -hmm. for example O key of David or mm -hmm. the root of Jesse mm -hmm. and they put it into Old English but with lots of expansions mm -hmm. and the expansions are very very deep mm -hmm. and intricate meditations on mm -hmm. Mary and the incarnation and um yeah the meaning of Christ mm -hmm. becoming uh God becoming man and mm -hmm. yeah they're just so complex um mm -hmm. they're very short but mm -hmm. they are extremely sophisticated theologically and mm -hmm. um you can just imagine them being read aloud in a um, monastic dining mm -hmm. room and right. yeah they're extremely vivid how they capture salvation mm -hmm. history and mm -hmm. man's interaction with God through grace so yeah right. I recommend them as well that's beautiful do you think you could you could say that that these poems are theology as well as being poems as in are they do they just kind of have theological concerns or could you actually say that it is a kind of theology if that makes sense yeah I think I would definitely argue for a mm. kind of theology. Um, That's very yeah. interesting. I've been thinking yeah. a lot about that with uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. Like, mm. Could you say that it is theology in its own right, as well as being a poem? Uh, so that's very interesting. Okay, yeah. thank you. That's fantastic. Very good. Well, just before you leave us, could you tell us, is there anywhere where we can find more about you or your work um, or anything like that? Yes, um, so I have a few blog posts on mm -hmm. introducing medieval Christianity, uh, which is a mm -hmm. site designed to 
um, explain basic doctrine um, of Catholicism mm -hmm. and how this has continued through the church's tradition mm -hmm. from the Middle Ages to the present day. Mm -hmm. um, and I also have an article mm -hmm. um, written in a journal called Selim, and it's about um, Augustine mm -hmm. uh, during King Alfred the Great's translation program. Mm -hmm. And I will also have an article hopefully coming out in the next few months on the Advent lyrics themselves. <gasps> Congratulations, that's fantastic. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, do you have any final thoughts or any final words you want to leave us with before we let you go? I would just say, um, I would just really encourage anybody who has um, faith to really not be afraid of pursuing mm -hmm. um, theology or um, li literary studies that are mm -hmm. theologically informed because it's honestly such an enriching experience it and <laughs> it's really brought me closer to God and I'm sure many other people as well um, have that experience of encountering God through literature and mm -hmm. yeah I just think it's so important that more people contribute to scholarship in such a way that really illuminates mm -hmm the divine truths that yeah. are late in literature so yeah. yeah it's difficult and it mm -hmm. requires a lot of determination but For sure. I would really encourage it I completely agree with that I, I second your thoughts that's a beautiful um note to end with I I also think that just more people should think of the humanities as being something kind of holistic and we should all kind of be interested in in different yeah. disciplines within the humanities and I think it really is so enriching when you learn more about history and theology and philosophy that makes you a better literary scholar I think yeah. um, so that's wonderful well thank you so much Jasmine for uh, being thank with us today you. and yeah everyone should go check out Jasmine's work <laughs> please all right thank you so much bye thank you. bye